All right, on to kind of for lecture B. Um, may have ended the other one kind of abruptly because I thought I had one more slide to go, but basically we ended the last lecture looking at the um, couple of bird species that are endangered species that are also very much tied to what we considered the old growth. And that old growth tends to be associated with our redwoods and uh, again some of the very large conifer species in California like Doug fir. So a quick review of conifers. Remember conifer, uh, conifers are, are gymnosperms which literally means a naked seed. 58 species of conifers are native to California and half of those are only found in California. These are evergreen trees uh, that, that basically um, they, they constantly lose needles. They don't lose them all during one season like, uh, like deciduous trees do. The cone is the distinct reproductive structure. Again, think of the flower of any other plant. That is what the cone is equivalent to. And the leaves are found in the form of uh, needle-like leaves or scale-like leaves. But, um, but the needles that we find on these uh, conifers or the scale-like leaves that we find on trees like incense cedar are still leaves. They're just specialized um, leaves. And a lot of the conifers are, are specifically adapted to dealing with drought. And remember, drought can be down in the valley where we have six months of the year when we have a rainy season and six months of the year when we basically have a dry season with no, if in, with little, if any, rain. But also think about those bristle cone firs. If you're up at 12,000 feet and there's frozen water on the ground 10, 11 months out of the year, you're not getting water. You can't, it'd be like, it's like trying to suck a frozen milkshake through a straw. It just doesn't happen, right? So trees, even if they're surrounded by snow, in the winter time, when it's cold and the water is frozen as snow, trees still basically have to be drought tolerant. Again, it seems kind of odd to think of a tree that's surrounded by snow as being drought tolerant, but, but again, frozen water is just as bad as no water. And then, of course, to the freezing temperatures that we find at those high elevations in particular. So on to the cypress family. Um, again, most of these are in the in the uh, genus Cupressaceae. I mean, family Cupressaceae. They tend to have narrow leaves that we that we call scale-like, meaning they they sort of look like the overlapping scales of a of a fish, or the like the shingles of a roof. Small rounded cones, generally speaking, that are that are usually serotonous, and also the cones that stay closed even after the seeds are ready to come out. So again, they kind of hold those seeds and protect them and wait for the right conditions to come along. The coast redwood and the giant sequoia are both included in, in the cypress family. And that's where we'll start. Again, a, a species of tree that we're really fortunate to have in California and um, so close to those of us up in Northern California. Again, we see kind of needle-like leaves, like a um, little more like the fir, sort of a barrel, rounded shaped cone. But notice the other thing is that the scales don't overlap like they do on all of those pine trees we looked at. Scales basically stick straight out. And this is the, the female cone. Again, the seeds are inside of there. I think we're probably all familiar with the type of habitat that the coast redwood exists in. They're generally close to the ocean, uh, thick canopies, kind of almost feels like, you know, their dinosaurs would be hanging out in there. A lot of ferns in the understory, a few other species of, lots of other species of plants, but the redwood forest tends to be dominated by the red. These are um, generally the tallest trees in the world. Uh, uh, 
a number of them that that uh, that are easily over 300 feet. I think the tallest one was in the range of 362 or 367 feet tall, um, 15 feet in diameter or more. These are also really long-lived trees, but um, but not as old as uh, some people think. They think they're the oldest trees, but as we spoke about earlier, the bristlecone pines are definitely the oldest trees. 2,000 years is still a really old tree, don't get me wrong, but um, but they they uh, they don't get anywhere near as old as bristlecone pine. As I mentioned, these species tend to be within relatively close distances of the coastline because they um, live in the fog belt. So they depend on that foggy kind of weather that, um, that kind of keeps them nice and moist. They like humid habitats. Um, they also like living in the, um, in the shaded, uh, the shade under the canopy of, of um, the young ones grow up in the canopy under older ones, and so they're very shade tolerant. There's a stat here that we only have maybe about 4% of old growth left. Um, I'm using that stat, although I, I question it just a tiny bit. Um, but th there's no doubt that, um, you know, back before we, we knew any better, we, we really, really um, harvested a lot of redwoods because they're huge trees, super valuable from a timber standpoint. They still are today. The difference is today we really don't go in and harvest old growth redwoods any longer. We still do grow redwood trees to be harvested for timber, but it's generally done by um, by companies that grow them um, sort of like we grow corn. And so they're grown specifically for harvesting rather than cutting down the, the big old ones that are left. Sometimes forestry gets a gets a bad rap or timber harvesting gets you know maybe a little misunderstood like a lot of things wood is the ultimate resource to build with it's far better than any other resource because it is renewable and, and we're doing a, a good job today of, of you know keeping our forests healthy and growing back although there are some problems of course it's the ultimate reusable and recyclable material. It's a renewable resource, unlike all the stuff we dig out of the ground, the metals and the minerals and all of that. So th in a lot of cases, timber companies grow trees like farmers grow crops. We don't necessarily grow them in rows like, like a field of corn, but we, we dedicate some areas uh, to just growing trees because the, we, we still have a demand for wood products. Uh, again, home to some rare species, uh, old growth forests that uh, they're important habitat for species like the spotted owl, the murrelet, and even this kind of tree climbing vole, uh, something that's related to, uh, say, a mouse. close relative of the uh, coast redwood is the giant sequoia. These are trees that grow in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains, not near the coast. They grow at elevations around the mixed conifer forest, so 5,000 feet or so. They don't tend to get quite as tall as the coast redwood, but they, they get or they can get larger in diameter than the coast redwood. Uh, the tree on the right there, if you can barely read that sign, it says General Grant. It's one of the largest trees. I actually can't remember off the top of my head if, if that's the largest in diameter or not. Striking feature is these trees are huge diameter, and they, and they, they almost go straight up. They don't you know, get narrower and narrower and, and end up in a point like most other trees. Typically, by the time they get... 250 feet tall and, and get beyond that, the tops kind of start dying back, and uh, and then the you know it kind of just stops growing up, but it keeps growing out. And also, this is a fire scar we call a cat face. 
don't know the origin of that per se, but a fire scar. These are very fire adapted species, fire resistant bark, uh, because they live in a habitat where fire is, is uh, important to them for reproduction. Serotonous species like some of the other ones we've spoken about. So again, a very uh, fire adapted cone, looks very similar to the coast redwood. Different types of needles though, they don't have the, the needle-like leaves, they've got little more prickly scale-like leaves than the um, coast redwood. Again, these are generally considered the largest trees, not the tallest. Again, 275 feet tall um, is maybe almost 100 feet shorter than a red coast redwood gets, but 35 feet in diameter. They only exist in about a 75 mile range north to south from, um, from north of Yosemite down to uh, Fresno and Tulare County, so in the mountains east of Fresno. Uh, and also not even just a solid population. All these dots on the map represent isolated groves that could be from just a few trees to maybe a hundred or so. But all these little dots are separate populations of trees. And as you see, when you f get up north of Fresno County, now they're in very isolated little populations. It starts getting really sparse. Some of the trees that, um, that you see in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, like the General Grant, are, are huge. You get up into areas where they logged the giant Sequoia, and you can find stumps that are just, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how large these things are until you actually go crawl up on it. They actually cut one tree down uh, that, they, that they basically made a dance floor out of. They could have, you know, dozens of people all on the tree at the same time. When I taught in uh, Reedley College, which is uh, a little bit south of Fresno, we would go up to an area called Converse Basin an area where there were still giant sequoia, but also a lot of them that had been logged. And we'd always get up, every year we'd get a, get our, our whole class up there and um, get all, you know, maybe upwards of 50 or so students on the stump and, and take a photograph every, every year up there. Again, just really, really interesting trees, unique to California and, um, and really, uh, you know, something you just have to see. Some unique reproduction going on as well. They, um, they generally get pretty old before they start really producing seeds and uh, viable seeds. And then they produce into old age, meaning basically they don't stop producing up till they're, you know, till they die at, at maybe 1500 years old. Again, the cone stays closed on the tree, even up to 20 years. So imagine this cone grows, the uh, seeds get fertilized, and then the cone kind of closes back up, and it might just wait for upwards of 20 years, again, for the right conditions. Three ways or agents that disperse the seeds of the giant sequoia. There's a, a, a wood-boring beetle that'll, uh, you know, get in the cones or, or um, or chew them off the tree basically and uh, cause the dispersal. There's also the Douglas squirrel or, or also called the chicory that'll be up in the redwood trees and um, uh, you know chew the stem of the cone off so it falls to the ground. And then of course they'll you know chew it and get it open and, and uh, stuff the seeds in their mouth like a chipmunk. And they'll go bury them and of course they'll use it as food, but in the process of burying them, of course they don't always find every seed they buried. And so basically they're little, little gardeners that go around planting the giant sequoia seeds. And then of course, as you would guess, hopefully because it's a serotonous cone, that fire is also an agent of dispersal. One of the biggest problems that these trees are facing is the drought really hurt them. The, the multiple year drought we were just getting over 
really was stressing these trees out. There were a lot of scientists doing research because they were really concerned that the drought, especially if it kept going much longer, that um, a lot of these trees were really stressed out, water stress in other words, from the drought, and that it really could have caused some major problems. Um, and then um, the ongoing problem of uh, that we have all over California of our forests just getting too thick. You know, trees growing, um, putting out fires, not letting natural fires burn as much as we could, not being able to go in and thin the forests out manually, you know, with chainsaws uh, for a variety of reasons. A lot of the areas where these giant sequoias grow, and you can almost tell by looking at the one in the upper left here, got all these white fir trees. And they just get thicker and thicker and thicker. And if a fire were to come through, it would kill off a lot of those white firs because they don't really have resistant bark. And it might scar the giant sequoia, but, but not, uh, not kill it. And so the fire would not only kill off competitors like the white fir, but then it would open the cone and the seeds would be able to fall and there'd be lots of places for the new giant sequoias to grow. But the more these white fir and incense cedar trees grow, and the more they pack in and, and, and uh, you know, make a really dense forest, forests that are denser than they ever should have been, then when you get a fire and you can't put it out, now there's all kinds of fuel. All of these white firs are just fuel. And whereas the fire would have come through the forest floor and might scar the tree like you see here, now these fires get up into the canopy. They burn up into the canopy of the white fir. And then they get up into the canopy of the giant sequoia. And that's how those giant sequoias get killed. They can withstand normal kind of natural level fires. But when those fires get up in the canopy, that's when they can kill. So a, a big struggle for people trying to manage the sequoias is to be able to thin out these areas and also introduce fire back into these habitats where it uh, hasn't happened much. So I guess with that, we didn't have a picture of the pine cone. Uh, the cone is, uh, you can see a few of them here. They're actually kind of, they refer to them as kind of like duckbills. So they have kind of two main scales that kind of curve out. And so kind of, if you imagine like the upper and lower bill of a duck, uh, and again, you can always Google incense cedar cone and uh, get a close-up look at that. I'll, I'll add one of those on there. I'm not sure I, I don't have one on there. One of the problems with the incense cedar is that it was always part of a mixed conifer forest, dominated by ponderosa pine and white pine, lesser amounts of white fir and incense cedar, and black oak. Because we harvested, we, we, we sought out the dug fir and the uh, sugar pine and the ponderosa pine. And we tended to leave some of the cedar and the white fir because they weren't as valuable. Well, again, imagine you're cutting down all those trees and you're leaving some behind. Naturally, the ones that are left are going to then have less to compete against. And so then they can start thriving. We have more white fir and incense cedar growing in California than we ever did in the past. And it's 100% because of us selectively harvesting some trees and leaving others behind. So now it's usually part of uh, uh, forest management that you try to um, get the forests back to the balance they would have been at, you know, 100 years ago. So you try to leave more of the uh, sugar pine and, and dug fir and remove more of the incense cedar and, and the white fir. Try again, trying again to get that forest back in balance the way it was uh, prior to us um, harvesting when we didn't really understand forests as well as we do now. Another interesting cedar that's endemic to a very small area, not just California, but also Oregon, called Port Orford cedar. 
There's a small population that we can find if you go up to Mount Shasta and um, head up towards uh, past Lake Siskiyou and drive up the road that goes up uh, towards Gumboot. There's an area back in there, Cedar Basin, that has a lot of really interesting trees all located in a small area. And that's the one area close by that you can find Port Orford. Again, a very small, limited population, moist areas, uh, also found in serpentine soils. But it's also a uh, species like the giant sequoia that we're, that we're very carefully monitoring because a disease has been introduced and with um, with uh, with humans, it uh, it can be spread to these trees. You know, on the getting spores uh, uh, that get up under the car, that get on your boots, and then you go hiking into these areas where these trees are. It was a very valuable species that uh, would be used for things like the wood that would be uh, that would be used to build boats back. You know, wooden sailboats, for example. Um, but uh, but there's a very limited use of it these days because again how how um, rare it is. Needles kind of like the incense cedar, but tiny little uh, little spiky cones, very small little round spiky ball kind of cones. It has a more wispy look. I guess that's kind of a weird word. I can't even define what wispy means, but. If you look at an incense cedar and a Port Orford next to each other, the Port Orford just looks wispier, a little more droopy, um, you know, than the uh, than the incense cedar. But again, if you drive the road out of Mount Shasta that goes up towards Castle Lake and up above Siskiyou, you keep going, not towards Castle, but uh, the other way, and eventually you get up where the road kind of. Uh, dead ends at Gumboot Lake and, and that general area is where you can find Port Orford. Another member of this group is the uh, junipers. We've pretty much got one or two species of juniper, Sierra and Western juniper, out here. Um, there is common juniper and mountain juniper as well, but the uh, the Western and Sierra or Califor California juniper are the are the uh, the most widespread, real short, rounded trees. Um, they do well in in harsh conditions. You think about the Modoc Plateau, right? Kind of mid elevation, dry, deserty. The eastern side of um, Oregon, again, that drier kind of habitat. The eastern slopes of the Sierra Nevada. So they are a, a species adapted to those kinds of uh, dry climates. The common juniper is much more widespread, especially north into Canada, Alaska, throughout little pockets throughout the U.S. The California juniper or Sierra, I think Western juniper is actually a common name is Sierra. Again, that's a problem with common names, but. California juniper spread throughout the state, but more in the coastal mountains and, and uh, central to southern California. Another endemic species, the Monterey cypress. Remember, we had Monterey pine. Now we got a Monterey cypress. Relatively small tree, pretty rare. Only a couple of populations, um, Cambria north towards Carmel. Again, very gnarly trees because um, they live right there uh, along the coastline, so they're always being, uh, you know, affected by the, the constant breezes coming off the ocean. They have been propagated and in, into um, to to, uh, to landscaping, so they've uh, they basically made versions of these that they now sell uh, that you can buy for your own yard that have been. Um, bred and, and engineered to be able to handle, um, you know, maybe maybe um, different conditions than they would experience on the coast, warmer climates, drier climates. But again, an endemic species, pretty narrow, limited range. Again, showing the range there. 
Also got a, an interesting species called the Pacific U. Again, it's relatively uncommon. It looks like it's pretty abundant based on the range, but just because, like, for example, this entire area um, from Tahoe, you know, up north of us, just because that's shaded doesn't mean that it's solid with this species. You only find the Pacific U in very specific microclimates within these areas that are shaded. They like to be along streams, north-facing slopes, which are going to be cooler, much moister. Um, they're very slow-growing, short trees that contain a, um, a, a chemical that we were able to identify, Taxol. Anybody recognize that? Taxol. So, unfortunately, I think maybe this will ring a bell with you. I think the commercial says Taxotere. It's one of those um, lawsuits now that you see on TV. It mentions if you were treated for, I think it was breast cancer and, and um, you know, your hair wasn't growing back at all after the treatments stopped, that um, now they're, they're suing the drug company. We've, ac we've isolated Taxol for quite a while as having benefits to, to being able to, um, um, you know, treat cancer. And so it's a species of tree that, um, that has that kind of value to it. Even though they're very slow growing, they can get pretty old, 300 plus years. has a unique type of seed called an arrow. Unlike every other cone we've looked at that are, that are kind of woody, this is actually a fleshy conifer cone. And it's, again, technically it's an arrow, not a cone. But um, basically you see the seed down inside of there. And this is what it looks like as it's um, uh, after the uh, seed is developed and the, the fleshy part, the fruit part of it has kind of fallen away. Again, a completely unique type of cone, even though it's still a conifer, um, a gymnosperm. Again, notice naked seed, right? If this were a berry, the seeds would be completely inside of that fruit. In this case, again, there's kind of an opening where that seed is visible. So it's still a naked seed. So here we see some U's in the foreground on the right, some small ones on the left. See things like dogwood and, and again other plants that really like living in moist climates. Some more examples. I also mentioned the California nutmeg. Um, again, uh, another one that seems a little different that doesn't quite fit the mold of conifers. It has needle like leaves that are very sharp and pointy, they're stiff. This is not one of those trees you want to just grab the needles because it, it will hurt. The uh, nutmeg has a, again, a different type of fruit that's called a droop. So it's actually kind of a, a fleshy fruit that has one large seed on the inside of it. Think of something like an olive or a peach even. Same category as, uh, of fruit as uh, olives and peaches. But again, still considered... Uh, a conifer. Again, you can see all these little isolated populations. Um, it also um, likes to be down in canyons, on north slopes, in, in moister habitats, but, um, but it also can exist in, in more brushy habitats. Shade tolerant, again, it likes being shaded, not fire resistant at all. It's actually happiest growing in the redwood forests, but again, as you can see, it exists in the uh, Sierra Nevada, north to south, but again, just isolated areas, not widespread at all. Small to medium tree, although I saw one that was really tall, probably 150 feet tall, pretty big diameter. And uh, another little, little interesting fact, the leaves actually, if you kind of crush them a little bit in your hand, they don't smell very good. Kind of a foul odor. A couple of hemlock species, um, locally common in the Klamath and Cascade Mountains, 
um, the western hemlock and the mountain hemlock. Both have pretty droopy branches. The, uh, the western hemlock is, is more along the coast. The mountain hemlock is higher elevations. We have it up in uh, Lassen National Park. As you're um, getting up around the 8,000 foot elevation uh, on the road through the park, if you look carefully at the conifers that are up there, the bigger ones are, are probably the mountain hemlock. Slightly more papery type cones than the really uh, more robust woody cones. Again, typically if you look at the tree overall, it'll have this droopier profile to it which helps it stand out as being different than the firs and the pines. The mountain hemlock is still a little bit droopy, but, but shorter needles, not really, not really nearly as much of the droopy look, more of a bristly look to it. And you can see it exists all the way um, up into Alaska, but, but mostly along the coast and at higher elevations. Got three species of spruce that also have very limited ranges. Um, Brewers, spruce, and the Klamath Mountains up at the highest elevations. Engelman, that's pretty rare, but you can find it in Siskiyou and Shasta counties. And then the Sitka spruce, which is by far the, the most widespread of the three. It's in the north coast on up into Oregon and and um, I believe through Washington and, and the coast of Canada, um, called the tidewater spruce because generally it's going to be within sight of the ocean. Sitka spruce is, is, as I said, the most widespread. Also, again, has timber value, so it is a, a um, harvested species of tree. Bottle brush needles, kind of like the Doug fir, but the shorter, stiffer needles. Again, papery kind of cones, not not the woodier cone of the pine trees. If you're interested in in um, in learning more about the conifers and um, and just uh, you know, kind of searching around and trying to find them, there's the website Conifer Country, and lots of lots of really good information there for you to check out if you're interested. So that wraps up the, uh, the quick overview of, uh, of the kind of important conifers we have uh, throughout California and, and uh, some of the western U.S.